Okay, good morning to everybody. Um, I'm going to present a work that we have developed in, col in collaboration between the University of Zaragoza at the Advanced Information Systems Laboratory and the University of Jaén at the Research Group of Cartographic Engineering. Um, well, uh, I will try to, to make my presentations in 10 minutes, although the, the subject or the topic is a bit complex, uh, but uh, I will try to make it. So to start, uh, everybody knows that metadata is an essential tool for discovery and monitoring, and that metadata standardization efforts include abstract test suites, test suites or produce guidelines to assure interoperability within systems. Mainly syntactic interoperability is achieved by means of XML encoding specifications and semantic interoperability is achieved because we share common metadata models and also there are additional requirements, recommendations, and different guidelines. Uh, also, we have uh, nowadays uh, several tools based on XML schema validation or schematrons that help us to assure interoperability and check mainly completeness, the commission or omission of metadata elements and consistency. So we check that uh, metadata records have the, the the necessary format and all the elements have uh, the appropriate domain. However, little attention is paid to the accuracy of metadata. I mean, uh, we don't check if uh, the description of resources is using factual and correct information and current information. And the question is whether a catalog should maintain metadata records incorrectly classified, for example, sometimes we we can find administrative boundaries data sets classified as land use, or sometimes we have uh, links that are broken in our metadata. So uh, what we have proposed is a method for analyzing the quality considering aspects other than interoperability. Uh, at the beginning of this week, uh, we have published a paper in the International Journal of Geographical Information and Science, which is a method based on ISO 9157. 9, this uh, standard is uh, a standard for geographic information quality, and we have adapted this standard to the metadata case. Why? Because apart from consistency and completeness, accuracy and a correctness of temporal position and attribute information is exhaustively, exhaustively covered in ISO 19157. Here we have a diagram with all the quality elements that are studied in this standard for uh, spatial information, and we have adapted all the quality elements that are uh, remarked uh, in red. So we have uh, focus on completeness, both uh, completeness omission and completeness commission. We have also adapted uh, thematic accuracy. We are checking thematic classification correctness and the correctness of non-quantitative uh, attributes. We are also checking uh, logical consistency, I mean conceptual domain format and topological consistency. We are also checking the temporal quality of some metadata elements. So we are checking uh, temporal consistency and the validity of some dates. And uh, we are not uh, checking positional accuracy because we don't have real coordinates in metadata. We have a geographic extent, but this geographic extent of the data set I mean, the, the area covered by, by the data set is an approximate uh, area. So it's not possible to check accuracy. What we check if is this position is really correct, if it refers to the area that uh, the data set is really covering. Additionally, this ISO standard for geographic information quality has the advantage that has propose different measures for, for each quality element. And uh, our method consists of a set of quality checks which are based on controls. So uh, controls 
try to determine whether a parameter of a product satisfies a specific requirement. For example, it's typical to check that, uh, well, a parameter has no more than 5% of errors. And in this case, our product is a set of uh, metadata records and uh, some of the controls that we propose are automatic or can be automated and they are applied to the full data set and we try to, to have an acceptance quality limit of around 5% of errors or 95% of uh, correct, correct rate but other times control must be manually applied. In that case, we are using also the tables of ISO 2859 part two, which is a standard for uh, general quality. Uh, specifically, this is the, the standard about sampling plans in this by limiting quality for isolated lot, lot inspection. And uh, this standard and the table in this standard uh, tell us how many records should be sampled and how many errors should we accept to pass this control. So here I try to explain more or less um, how we have impl implemented the quality elements with some controls and measures and we have applied the, these controls on some representative metadata elements. So for example, with respect to completeness, we check completeness, commission or omission. In the case of uh, completeness, commission, we identify records that have additional instances in one of their metadata elements. And what we measure corresponds with uh, measure D.3 if we go to the ISO 19 uh, 157 standard, and this is a rate of excess, excess items, items. In the case of omission, we identify records that don't, don't have mandatory elements correctly filled. Uh, about consistency, uh, we check, of course, uh, typical conceptual consistency, checking if metadata records follow the ISO 19139 XML schema, but we also check a specific consistency for some elements, for example, for a scale or for grid dimensions or the count of geometric, geometric objects. And we check if these metadata elements are consistent with the rest of information that we can find in metadata records. Uh, we also check uh, general domain consistency. So we check if the metadata elements contains the values uh, allowed by ISO 19139, of course, but also we check a specific uh, domain consistency of some metadata elements. For example, we check if the coordinates of uh, bounding boxes uh, are in a valid range. So if they are long latitude and longitude uh, real values. Um, also, with respect to consistency, we also check general format consistency. So we check if uh, metadata records are using an XML encoding, which is the typical format uh, to serialize metadata. And also we check, uh, for example, something that is uh, new, it's uh, topological consistency. So trying to find a parallel in metadata, we try to analyze the relationships between a metadata record and other metadata, metadata records in the collection. So for example, we check if the, the reference to the parent identifiers, so the, the reference to other metadata records describing a parent data set are correct or not. Uh, we also check the internal relationship of metadata elements. For example, we check if the geographic extent and the geographic scope of uh, our quality reports are compatible. Because as you know, we can specify the quality of an area of the data set. So we try to check if these uh, bounded bosses are compatible. And with respect to dates, uh, we also have a control on the temporal consistency 
that try to verify if uh, time sequences are correct. So we check if the creation is previous to the publication and if the publication is previous to the revision of metadata or data. And about accuracy and correctness, we also check uh, several, several things. For example, with respect to dates, we check if harvesting date falls within the last reported timestamp for metadata plus the update frequency. We also check uh, the thematic classification, so we check keywords manually. Uh, yes, there is no other way. Uh, and we check whether the, this rec uh, record has been correctly classified. Uh, we also check the, the accuracy of non-quantitative -quantita attributes. For example, we check if um, emails are correct. And also, uh, we check if, for example, the telephone number of the name of the organization are correct right now. So we, we are asking the responsible of the data sets. Also, we check if the geographic extent it's uh, correct in the sense that there are other place names in metadata that really refer to this geographic extent. And we have also a special element uh, of quality for free tests because uh, in metadata we have uh, prosaic tests and we should check uh, the quality. So we have also two me measures for this. We have an overall quality uh, evaluated by, by a panel of experts on abstract purpose and lineage uh, metadata elements. And also we have uh, a compute, a readability index to check whether the, the test is easy to read or not. We have done some experiments of this method with a metadata corpus of the Spanish spatial data infrastructure. We downloaded the metadata in 2016. We have about uh, 4,000 records. The results are not very good because uh, only nine controls out of 26, 26 uh, measures have been passed and 17 uh, controls have failed. Especially we fail in accuracy, correctness, and quality of free tests. But uh, this is uh, mainly because uh, metadata uh, nowadays is focused on interoperability, but uh, doesn't, doesn't focus on accuracy and correctness. As conclusions, uh, we have uh, tried to propose a formal method to analyze quality based on controls. Although we initially thought for ISO 19115 is adaptable to other metadata standards and profiles. Uh, we have proposed uh, 12 quality elements with uh, 26 associated measures. 15 measures can be automated. Five measures are uh, equivalent to what we are doing now with uh, some validators, but 10 are completely new. And about the future, we would like to combine this method with uh, blockchain technology Maybe we are very enthusiastic or very brave to do it, but uh, we would like to use the automatic controls of metadata accuracy and correctness as the base for blockchain-based SDI smart contracts. For example, SDI nodes could commit uh, to unpublishing metadata and resources or at least to revising them when, for example, the automatic measures associated to non-quantitative attribute accuracy on electronic addresses fail, or when the error rate of incorrect time sec sequences increases, or when the readability index of free test metadata elements decays. So that's all from my part. Thank you very much. And if you have questions. Okay. Sorry, Katarin from Katarin Tulika from CERB. Um, I have a quick question. You mentioned automatic controls of metadata several times. Could you be a bit more specific on the on the exact con uh, controls? Thank you. Yes, uh, some of the measures uh, can be automated because 
we can develop programs, we have developed some Java programs, and we can check uh, the XML elements, and for example, we can, over a collection of metadata records, we can identify, for example, if the parent identifier points to a real record in the collection. We don't find this uh, parent record, we detect uh, a problem. Or, for example, we, we can check the compatibility of geographic extent of the geographic extent and the geographic scope of data quality report very easy because they are two elements and we can check the, the difference and we can check that there is no overlapping. So in general, the 10 measures that can be automated are automated like that and five other measures are automated in the typical way of, of uh, Inspire Validator does. does. Yeah, so good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so basically what we did also goes a little bit into this last point uh, that was just mentioned, which is about assuring the quality of metadata to a large degree. Uh, so what I want to present you today is um, yeah, the outcome of a project that we did together uh, with the LGL Baden-Württemberg, which is one of the state-level organizations in Germany uh, working to also provide Inspire services, data, metadata, everything related to that. They approached us about a year ago and they said, yeah, uh, we have our own metadata profile and we would really like to make the maintenance of that a bit more straightforward as well as the implementation. And uh, so they, they currently have a, a big Excel table more or less. I'm going to go into that in a moment where the profile is uh, maintained. And they had a lot of issues in actually implementing that because uh, if you give that Excel table to different people, everybody interprets it in a different way. So for us, the question was, okay, if we want to make this simpler, can we actually formally define a profile as in computer readable? And can we use that profile to generate all documentation as well as example XML files and also things like the validation routines, the executable test suits effectively? And of course, we, we also wanted to make sure that we can use the same information to improve the generation of metadata so that the quality is actually higher than if people basically manually create it, and they will make errors at some point. Okay, so first let's have a look at the question how we uh, can formally define a profile. So basically what we took was a hierarchical approach, uh, like usual. Uh, so there's the schema, the, the ISO, uh, yeah, basically the ISO metadata schema for Inspire, that's the uh, API ISO, uh, 1.0.0 of CSW 2.0.2 with some extra stuff. I guess you all know that. Uh, but then we actually want to define profiles on top. And a profile usually means that I take this data model and I constrain it. So I put additional rules on top, like how I expect to use that model. And in our world, we usually have a hierarchy of models, and particularly in this case, at the very bottom, so to speak, we have the profile of the state of Baden-Württemberg. Um, but that's also, that's actually a subset, or it's a superset, sorry, it's a more specific set of rules than the one for Germany. But it's a subset in the sense of how I can use the data model. And the same is true for those as well. But in the end, um, each of these profiles can also be seen as a separate conformance class. We just define the rule that a data set actually has to comply to all of those. So they are additive in a certain way. Each one adds some new rules to the ones that were there before. Yeah, and uh, currently, however, what we had was one big Excel table that had all the profiles in it. So it really had the accumulated set of rules from all these different levels. That meant if something changed in one of the levels above, the maintainer of this Excel table would have to go through the several hundred rows and uh, update each of the rows according to the new rules that were there uh, in the DE profile or Inspire profile. So you can imagine it's quite a slough. And um, if we look into this into a bit more detail, I'm sorry, it's, uh, the Excel table is hard to read, uh, even when you have it open on the full screen. But basically, it has a few hundred rows where each row says, uh, yeah, it has a, a running number. Uh, then it has the, the name, and this is, indicates whether it's mandatory or not, the three columns. And then there is some additional information about how to use it, cardinality, examples, and so on. Like I said, long table. And uh, we looked at this information and thought, okay, how can we capture that in a computer processable model? 
And um, what can we do with that? And essentially what we, what we made up is a, a profile data model which contains property constraints. So that's for example when you similar to in a schema where you say I actually want to have this list of allowed values with an enumeration in a property or where you define occurrence or whether content is required. Those things are property constraints. We also added tagged values. I'll come to why we needed them in a moment. And consistency constraints. So consistency constraints are basically uh, conditions that you define across multiple elements in your data set. Like if value A is like this, then value B has to be like this. And we're using this model, and it's been set up in such a way that we can generate automatically both EGS test suits, so that's also what the Inspire Reference Validator, for example, is using, uh, the documentation, and also XML examples. So that was <coughs> something that was requested quite often, that implementers want to see what should the final outcome actually look like, uh, so that they know uh, how to implement that in their systems. Um, going through these different uh, parts more or less, so one thing that we did was define a set of constraints, these property constraints that I mentioned, and uh, they exist on two different levels. Uh, on one um, is basically on the whole type, and the others are really on individual properties. So for example, one thing that uh, you can't really test for in a GML application schema is whether a certain object is present. Uh, when an object is present, it will validate it, the XML schema. But here you can actually, with this little red toggle button at the top, you can define that you want this object type has to be present in the data set. Um, so we will look for, for that, and if it's not there, then the data set will be invalid. Um, another thing that's also possible is to define basically that content for a certain property is required. That's a bit equal to the nillable flag. So you're saying, okay, this, if this is uh, content required, no, then the property is nillable, otherwise it's not. Um, there are also property type constraints. So for example, we often have places where we actually have a choice in Inspire, uh, in metadata and also in the data models. Uh, so we can implement a certain, let's say for example, the service location in governmental services. I can give by polygon, by indicating a reference to a building, by a spatial name, lots of different things. But to simplify it and to make it uh, more interoperable, it's often useful to constrain this down to, for example, one option. Like here, we actually say that um, we're expecting MD resolution to be always expressed with a distance and not with an equivalent scale. And um, yeah, that's also a typical thing. In a profile, you always constrain things. Yeah, you don't add, add something, but rather you limit how it can be used. That brings me to the next point. Uh, it's also possible to define allowed values for any field. So for example, if there is uh, no constraint on the field before, it's basically a free text string, then you can set some values that are uh, explicitly allowed. If there is already a code list for a property, uh, like here in this case, the evaluation method type code. Uh, you can just remove options. So you click on one of these minus buttons and then that particular value will not be allowed anymore. Another constraint that's kind of typical is, is that uh, you can state how often you expect an element to occur. And uh, in, all, in, in, some, uh, in quite a lot of properties, we typically see that it's unbounded or that uh, the lower bound is zero, but if we want to say, for example, we expect exactly one um, occurrence of a certain element, we set the minimum and maximum count to one accordingly. It's also possible to put it to zero, and then that means that we would not have uh, yeah, that element, never ever, <laughs> in that profile. Uh, the, that was basically the constraints that I define on the property level. Like I said, it's also possible to look at the whole document and uh, define rules for consistency purposes. So for example, if we're setting, uh, if it's a, a, a single data set, we're expecting certain other values to be set uh, as from a scope code, for example. And doing that is possible using these consistency constraints. Uh, so yeah, just like I mentioned before, an example is if A exists or if B exists or if C exists, then it's valid. So, but we expect one of the three elements, for example. In other places, I can have conditions like when there is a value defined, I actually need to have, uh, there's, for example, this other restrictions rule. So if, if that is set to a certain value, then I'm expecting 
uh, another element to be present as well. Yeah, and uh, the workflow for that is basically I create uh, one of these constraints. I decide um, whether it needs to be multiple conditions or one. And uh, I can pick an operator, a logical operator, and then define the individual uh, conditions. And for that, I select the root context. So for example, am I starting from MD metadata uh, or from somewhere below? And I then select uh, the one or two properties to build this kind of if-then uh, conditions. And that looks like this. So I have a, basically a tree. And in the tree, for example, here at the bottom, I'm uh, looking for uh, cases where code list value is data set. And uh, yeah, sorry, going back once. And then there's the, I can leave that as is. So at that point, only this would need to be true. If it's data set, then I'm fine. For example, the profile might actually only be for data sets or services. But I can also set uh, additional rules in here. Uh, which is then logically like the then. So if this, then something else needs to exist or have a certain value. Uh, we also added a feature call, that's called tagged values. So that's basically, for example, for adding documentation. Like, um, you know, the export that we're doing is basically a, uh, as an executable test suite. And uh, for that, we need to be able to, on the one hand, group the individual test cases, and we also want to label and describe them. And uh, for that, we use things like test case label, description, and so on. And here's also the place where we put example values. So if you want to generate the example XML files later on, you can put in some concrete example files. Otherwise, we just generate random stuff. Uh, and you can also add any randomly freely defined additional info that you need here. That can be uh, important because uh, potentially we're going to add an, an UML export and other features later on as well. Um, this is a very small example of the documentation. So the output that you can do is, is basically a document because usually uh, like metadata uh, working groups have to decide on some document at the end. So the profile is really uh, written out as a document um, which has, uh, this is the so-called differential documentation. So if you, you can see that on the, in the green little box is the changed value and the black one is the original value from the schema. So you can immediately see where the profile actually makes changes uh, or, or restrictions. Yeah, it's also, like I said, possible to generate uh, some XML examples and I'm not going to throw a generated ETS at you because these are quite big. <laughs> I think that was enough uh, XML for the moment, but yeah. Maybe to simply, uh, to, to conclude now, uh, the, yeah, like I said, the core objectives were really to make it much easier to maintain the profiles, each one individually. So if there are changes on GDE.de or Inspire or ISO level, they are isolated from the rules that they define. That means they only have to take care of the really specific things for Baden-Württemberg. Uh, the automatic generation of all the required artifacts helps them a lot in the implementation because they can just distribute that to all the agencies and so on in the state. Uh, and yeah, also the actual generation of the metadata uh, is, is far more consistent than with the profile so that you don't have as many errors that you need to catch in validation later on. And that's it from my side. Hello. Uh, have you used model driving engineering uh, tools or frameworks to the configuration of the profiles? because I have more or less the same experience several years ago for the development of a metadata edition tool, mm -hmm. and it was, it, it was impossible to, to follow all the metadata standards and all the different profiles, so at the end, we decided mm -hmm. to create a tool to define models and generate automatically everything, so. Yep. Yeah, well, actually, the, the original request that the customer came to us with was to make this possible, but inside a UML environment like Enterprise Architect. And we looked into that for a period and basically found it to be impossible because there's so much that has to do with the actual structure of the data, not of the data model. So, uh, and trying to add, um, for example, really clearly um, working consistency constraints as OCR or something like that proved to be very, very hard. So you always end up doing a lot of custom tagged value stuff even in the UML model, which you can't display nicely, so you don't have proper documentation out of that. And yeah, so there was quite a bit of challenge to try basically a classical 
um, yeah, model-driven approach from really the UML model. So here I would say it's also model-driven, but not from a UML model. Really, there's a specific model for a profile underneath and what constitutes the profile. Good morning. Um, what I want to talk uh, about today is uh, the, the, the new metadata guidelines that uh, arrived uh, over a year ago. Um, and uh, what we have done with the, uh, the guidelines in, in GeoNetwork. Um, so what is GeoNetwork? It's a, it's a widely used uh, catalog application. Um, and uh, that's it. So an important aspect in the new metadata uh, guidelines are anchors. So um, uh, what we do is re uh, at various locations in the metadata, uh, the, a typical string is replaced for an anchor. So uh, to constrain uh, the, the value that you can add at that point and, uh, to a certain code list or uh, to link to external content uh, where you can uh, find additional information. So it's a, it's a very powerful mechanism to extend uh, uh, the metadata. Um, but then, if we want to use certain code lists, we ha first have to import those code lists. So this was one of the first uh, features that was developed, it's actually available in the current version already, is uh, that you can Im import uh, a code list from the Inspire registry. And then use it later to fill uh, for anchors. Um, another aspect that we're currently developing is a better mechanism to switch between character string and anchor. Because you, in theory, you're, you're able to, to switch any uh, string to, to anchor, so you need a, a kind of a mechanism to, in the editor to uh, be able to add uh, an hyperlink to any string. And the other one is to select a concept from Thesaurus in as, as soon as it is an anchor. Uh, ideas that you are able to configure these things in the in the metadata editor view uh, configuration. Uh, an important change in the metadata guidelines uh, relates to access points and endpoints. Um, the guidelines uh, guidelines uh, mandates the use of access point uh, from the Inspire registry code list, uh, but it's not very clear uh, the use of uh, of endpoint. Uh, we've been discussing about this topic uh, uh, as part of the Dutch government uh, national profile. Um, uh, if we could make that sen sense, uh, sensible. Um, and uh, so we, we made this clear distinction between endpoints and access points, where access points are, for example, WMS, WFS, and uh, an actual uh, downloadable file uh, is an endpoint. So th this uh, required, uh, requires us to, to set up two um, uh, code lists. This is not uh, mandated or suggested by, by the, by the uh, uh, technical guidelines, but this is more from an implementation perspective uh, useful. Um, and uh, in the, so this is only mandated in the Dutch uh, metadata profile. Um, two code lists. One for access points and one for endpoints. Uh, so on the endpoint list, you have all the media types that are um, uh, available. So, so you would uh, download a certain file having a certain media type. And on the access points, you find all the service types there. In the editor, this uh, uh, comes back to uh, uh, so this is config uh, configured on the, on the Dutch schema plugin only, but it could be uh, uh, used in any other um, uh, schema plugin. Um, so we have a division in endpoints and, 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 and access points, um, which you then can uh, select. So we specifically added also a couple of uh, formats with, which are broader than the uh, um, typical Inspire domain such as a GeoJSON, GeoPackage, um, which are also uh, commonly used. Um, the another aspect that, that changed um, is the, the, the dataset uh, service linkage, um, which 
um, if you happen to use this approach, would not change for you. But but we saw a lot of implementation that use a different um, uh, implementation because the previous metadata guidelines were not very concrete on this aspect. So uh, now in this new metadata guideline, there is a clear uh, uh, definition of this uh, link, and. Um, uh, so now we have to, to implement this uh, in, in Geo Network, which, which brings kind of a challenge to us because uh, uh, the, the, the guidelines mandate the use of a, of a URI uh, in the operates element, uh, operates on element, but um, a URI um, would have no meaning in Geo Network if, if the URI is not uh, registered somewhere. So if we want to link to that, that CSW on the other side, we actually may have to go and grab the, the other document on the other side to actually identify which uh, UUID it has. And, um, but we've also seen some implementations already, for, for example, the example which is in the metadata guideline, where also uh, they use the same identifier in the data set identifier uh, uh, section. And then we would actually be able to uh, link uh, the service to the data set using this URI. Unfortunately, the, the, the guideline is not very concrete if, if, if the URI in operates on should be the same one in, uh, as the one used in dataset identification. So that may be a suggestion for improvement. Um, so if we parse this, this operates on element, so this is either a CSW request, um, which I doubt if that can be considered a URI because the CSW request can have many, uh, an order of elements, for example, so would, from, from my perspective, not qualify as a URI, but it's in, as an example in the specification, so it's fine. Um, so is, or is a URI, which either or not is also present in the data set. And uh, yeah, so if, if both methods don't work, we have to, uh, go to the third option, which is to retrieve the actual document on the other side and parse it to retrieve the UUID. And so the goal of this is to be able to link from dataset to service and back in the, in the catalog application. So then there's this aspect of, of, uh, of history. Uh, the catalog currently contains a lot of Inspire uh, metadata records which are still on the 1.3 profile. And there's new records coming in uh, using the 2.0 profile. So when we do a validation on a record, we have to identify which profile is used uh, to, to create the record, to be able to say, okay, this is valid against that version of the profile that you're using. So we're suggesting here to use uh, multiple Schematron files one for the 1.3 profile and one for the 2.0 profile, and then uh, either let the user decide which, which uh, validation to apply, or maybe we can even use uh, the conforms to section in the metadata to identify uh, to which uh, technical guideline uh, uh, the metadata was created. Well, the other option is the one that we use in the Netherlands is to create a new schema plugin for the, for the 2.0 version. So you can uh, uh, put very, sp uh, yeah, you link your metadata to a certain schema plugin and you, you're sure that you validate against this, uh, this uh, plugin uh, version. It also gives you an, uh, the option to uh, create custom um, uh, for editor forms specific to the, cert uh, to the guideline that you're uh, publishing for. Uh, this uh, is another uh, uh, thing that uh, was added uh, recently is the, the option to uh, validate against the Inspire validator. So in that case, you don't use the internal uh, Geo Network validator, but you validate against the external uh, ETF uh, validator. You can either use the, the sandbox from JRC or uh, deploy your own uh, version of the validator and put your own uh, URL in the configuration. Um, and uh, another addition, which is currently pending, but, but probably coming soon, is uh, uh, a way to set up GeoNetwork as, as a download service provider. Uh, so in that case, uh, a metadata uh, record having uh, a zip file as a download will be converted to an Atom file, uh, which will, will then be retrievable via OpenSearch. So you do, uh, all the Atom generation is then managed by uh, GeoNetwork. 
The other option was already available. Um, that was uh, uh, is the option to also index uh, atom files which are uh, out there on the web and make them uh, uh, open search uh, capable. This this recently landed in uh, in uh, in. Uh, Geo network, which is quite a shock because we're talking about WFS3 uh, in this uh, in conference, and now WFS2 has landed in Geo network. <laughs> so, amazing. The point is that that most of the WFS clients or, uh, support both two and one. So, so for us, there was not much urgency to also support two, the two version, because we could always fall back to the the, uh, the one version. However, recently we've seen a couple of. Uh, GIS uh, servers that do not support the WFS1 anymore. They only support WFS2, and they would then fail in Geo Network. So uh, we've done some work to, to add the WFS2 capability, and uh, which is actually a nice feature if you want to uh, implement a zip and ship uh, uh, functionality, because it supports pagination, which uh, WFS1 does not. Thank you. That was it for me. So this, uh, this uh, presentation is also on behalf of Cor Melser from uh, the Dutch uh, Environment Institute, um, who has his birthday today, and, uh, and he's, uh, so he's back uh, in the Netherlands. Um, GDPR facilitated by Aspire. Um, last spring, we had, uh, I probably don't have to explain GDPR, do I? Maybe, no, okay, Let, let's leave that. So uh, one of the aspects of, of, of the regulation that people may not know is that uh, the regulation requires organizations to set up a registry where they uh, um, register their uh, processing activities on, on, on data. And uh, well, Inspire already offers us this, this nice feature uh, of capturing uh, this type of metadata uh, in, uh, in the discovery services uh, TG. So that, that could be helpful. Well then, and then the vice versa method. How could Inspire be facilitated by GDPR? Um, well, we, we've seen a lot of activity in organizations to, to uh, get their data in order. They were going uh, to, uh, the, to all the dark corners of the organization to see what, what kind of data are they managing. And apparently, these data sets were not available in the catalog yet. So we see a, a, a dramatic increase of data sets being registered in the catalog, which previously were just out there somewhere and nobody knew they existed. So we see for Inspire a huge increase of, of data sets in the catalog, and in, which overall gives you a better knowledge of, of the system, of, of what type of data is available. So that, that, that brought us to the idea to use the existing GeoNetwork implementation at the, at the National Environment Institute as a GDPR registry. So GeoNetwork is, uh, like I just mentioned, is, is used in that uh, group. So uh, the benefits for them were, were very clear. Uh, they didn't have to maintain a new software package because well, the, the ministry also provided kind of a GDPR uh, software but then they would have to maintain a new uh, package. Uh, there was no information redundancy, because uh, the risk is that you put uh, the same information about the same data set in two different places. And there is uh, the option of central discovery. Let me skip that. So, um, and at the, at the institute, they actually broaden this up even. So they say, okay, well, we have the geospatial, we have the GDPR, but actually we also want to put the open data there. So we have everything in a central uh, catalog. I'll not talk uh, about open data today, but uh, um, that's another interesting topic. And uh, another thing that, that uh, came, uh, came up was the ISO 27001, which all the national uh, um, organizations in, the, in the, the Netherlands have to comply to, which is related to inf uh, inf information security. Um, so we added to also a couple of fields related to information security uh, to uh, the, the ISO 19139 profile. So they could also be able to manage that. 
So how do we do that? Um, at first, we try to squeeze more or less uh, all the GDPR fields into the ISO 19139 uh, uh, schema. But that, that didn't work out. There was too many um, uh, uh, yeah, squeezing involved, <laughs> which, which the semantic uh, 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 challenges. So what we ended up with was a, a new schema extension which then uh, is added uh, in the content info section, um, which is GDPR uh, content info. This, uh, uh, this schema is uh, registered here in the, the Metadata 101 schema regis register of GeoNetwork. So here you will find, uh, in Metadata 101, you will find all the national uh, schemas that are made available uh, to this repository. And uh, we registered the schema here, so it is free to use uh, for anybody. Um, then w there's always this discussion, wow, GDPR and, and discovery, wow, are, aren't those two conflicting concepts? Because GDPR is really constraining and limiting access to data. On the other hand, discovery is uh, as widely publishing of data. So. Yeah, so we had to explain in the organization quite a lot that, uh, that a, a, catalog, uh, a catalog application to facilitate discovery is actually a, a good idea to, to put also sensitive data in. And, um, well, especially in the, in the security domain, it was really uh, for the ISO 27001, was a, was a, we had some interesting talks. So, but, there's an, there is an aspect that we had to be very careful that the sensitive information which is managed in the internal node of the institute would in no way get out to the external node which publishes the open data. So we, we put a, uh, an advanced filtering mechanism in the middle which uh, checks based on metadata content if a certain record is allowed to go um, to, to the outside world. And also there's a manual intervention. So also somebody has to approve external publication. Um, so uh, going to the conclusion, this was a minimal impact uh, project because uh, the software was already running. We just deployed a new schema. Um, and uh, we've we seen a, an increased number of data set registrations in the catalog. And also what it, what it brought was that there was a better visibility on the Inspire efforts within the organization. Because previously this was only the geo department knowing about Inspire, and now it was widened to the whole organization. Thank you. <laughs> ah, yeah, some screenshots. Maybe it's interesting. This is this is uh, all in Dutch. Sorry. So uh, you see a lot of tabs um, with all the the different fields that you have to put in place for GDPR. These are the types of data and how long they can be, made, uh, can be stored and uh, what type of uh, sources they have. This is a, a, an Excel export, from, so you get all the GDPR fields in an Excel. And this is how it looks on the front end, if you a view. You see the same tabs as in the editor. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, any question to, yes, Martin. Thanks for really interesting stuff. Uh, uh, two questions. First one, uh, does that mean that in this uh, particular institution you deployed the, the solution, was there also need to create the link between the specific metadata for the GDPR from the geospatial domain to the company internal system dealing with the GDPR information for all the other data? or they keep it on the company level in two separated systems. And the second question, uh, through the, your implementation, those new metadata elements were mandatory or they are still optional? Thanks a lot. Sorry, I missed the second one and the first one not totally clear. So uh, did I understand that uh, I suppose uh, there is only one registry huh, yeah. which has the GDPR information, so there's no linkage to, to anything? So through your uh, instance of the Geo Network, the relevant uh, metadata goes directly to that registry on the company level. 
Yeah, it's created oh, okay. in that registry. Okay. Yeah. And then, it, of, of course, goes to the ministry at some cool. point to do evaluation, but that, that is managed via this, uh, the Excel export. I see. And currently. the second was whether these uh, elements were mandatory or they were optional in the, in the interface of Geo Network. Um, some are mandatory and some are optional. That is managed in the schema, in the schema extension. Yeah. yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Lars Torgo. I come from the Danish Agency for Data Supply and Efficiency. Uh, in basic, we are the national ma mapping agency in Denmark. We are also the Inspire coordinate, uh, coordination body. Um, and yeah, today I will present our internal metadata production system. Um, I think a lot of you, or several of you, know how difficult it can be to, to motivate data owners to, to, to write good metadata and to maintain them. Um, we have tried to, to uh, motivate our own uh, data owners uh, with this system that aiming to, to bring the metadata closer to the data. Um, so we'll see. Uh, let's start with the Q&A, um, with the basic why, I will not tell how. Uh, so, in deep into technique I'm not, but I'll tell for who, and I will tell what, what capabilities the system has. Uh, yeah, why have we built the system? Um, we hear from our internal uh, data providers in the agency that they miss an insight of of which data that is stored in our central data warehouse, our data bank. Um, they feel that it go into not a black hole, but at least into a data container. So they need a better insight of, 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 of data. Uh, then we also have to serve several needs for multiply distribution of our uh, metadata. Yes, the National Inspire uh, catalog is one of them, but we also now have uh, open data catalogs, etc. So metadata has to go into several places. And last but not least, uh, we hope that this tool, this system, can still increase the quality of, uh, of our metadata. For whom is the system built? Yes, as I said, for our internal data owners so that they can produce and write and maintain good uh, metadata. And that should have the, um, um, yes, should, should, should also be, be, be a benefit for our external users um, when they read our metadata. And the capabilities. Well, we, of course, we can manage our metadata, write them, view them, etc. But as I said, our, our metadata is, is now very close to our data. That means that we can do some automatic uh, script that calculates some of the metadata values uh, from our data. Um, and uh, to, to, to support the, the, the need for the insight of, of, of data stored in the data warehouse, we have implemented a dashboard where the status and statistic for each data is, is being showed. And then, of course, we have to integrate the system into our national Inspire catalog. This picture shows um, the architecture in my agency um, and the data flow. Uh, we have several data managers uh, who works uh, with the um, administrative system or production system where they uh, yeah, maintain their data. Uh, as I said, we are a mapping agency, so the data we, we maintain is addresses, topographic data, etc. Um, and when they are maintained, they are being sent into our central data warehouse called Data Bank. And there they are stored uh, and made ready for distribution. We have our internal uh, distributor called Digital Map Supply. And we are also hosting uh, a new common public data distributor where the data also can be made uh, available. Um, we will now go and look into the system um, where, where it's located in the, in the data bank. It's um, yeah, implemented uh, in the same, um, in the same uh, database system, Oracle. 
and that allows uh, the system to, to do analysis in, in the actual data. Um, and and that's, that's going to be used for the dashboard, but also so that we can um, uh, populate uh, some of the uh, metadata records. And the one we can populate automatically from, from the data is, is uh, all the dates that has to be in, in metadata. It's the coordinate reference system code. Uh, and last but not least, it's also the, the bounding box um, uh, for uh, yeah, telling what, 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 what uh, geographic area does the data set cover. Um, I have this presentation to to explain how we dis, dis, distinguish between data sets and data sets. So in our uh, data warehouse, the, the, the data bank, we have all our data stored in, in tables uh, as feature types. Um, and they are, um, are, are structured or belongs to a database schema. Um, uh, and, and, and this schema we, we call a, a, a data set. Um, it, it's our internal uh, data set that is used for, for management. And, um, and, and we find it relevant to that these data sets also have metadata. So that is for our internal metadata that the system also um, is able to, to maintain. But on top of that, we have all our data set for distribution. In the schema, the, the data is, of course, not encoded that they will be when they are going to be distributed um, as, as, uh, as data for the surrounding world. And, and we have a, a lot of opportunities um, to to uh, to uh, how to say to, to merge data set and and have a, a, a limited number of, of, of tables in in, in data sets the, um, the, the various opportunities is shown that in, in most cases uh, um, a data set we, we distribute is, is a complete uh, uh, internal data set but we could also have examples where we combine uh, feature types into a data set for instance, buildings and cadastral parcels, that could be a, a data set. And we also have cases where a, a user uh, just needs a single feature type, uh, for instance, uh, the roadway ne network. So this system we have to support and, and to, to maintain, and, and that's the, also a capability of, of our system. So we have, two, we have two metadata in the system, the one for the internal data set and also one for uh, the external data set. And now think, where, where's the Inspire metadata? And the Inspire metadata is, of course, uh, the ones who describes the external data set because that's the data set we provide for, for our external users. So let's look into the system. This is the front page. Actually, there is uh, three entrants. Um, I will not talk about the last one because that is, uh, we also have metadata for our scanned paper maps, the one that's 100, 200 years old. That's not in scope of today, but today I'll talk about the metadata for internal data set and, and the data set for distributions. This is the front page. Um, we have uh, in the top corner uh, uh, an entrance to the administration uh, module in the in the whole system. Uh, I am allowed to to go in there and one of my colleagues, but that's it. Then we have each entrance for for uh, all our um, internal data sets where the metadata is 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 shown. Uh, with the little pin number three, it's able to, to uh, edit metadata, metadata if the user has uh, the right credentials. And last, number four, there is a link to the dashboard where all the statistics is, is visible. But I'll just show one of the uh, pages in the administration uh, module. Um, this is where we configure uh, the uh, internal data set. We select in number one uh, which database schema uh, this data set belongs to. And in number two, we 
we select uh, the, the the tables which belongs to that schema, and and that's where the actual data is stored. Or tables is 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 equal to to feature types. So so now we have now we have configured this uh, this part of the drawing as I showed before. Um, this is a, a metadata set for um, for um, an in internal data set. We shall not go it into detail. It's also written in Danish, but there's text fill fields, there's drop down menus. We 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 use a lot of drop down menus, so the 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 writer of metadata all all uh, only can 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 uh, pick through, uh, 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 in 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 a closed code list. But um, the dates and and the uh, bounding box, they are automatically uh, written into uh, the metadata. Uh, and up here we have the link to the dashboard, and the dashboard is also uh, automatically populated. It happens each morning, a uh, scheduled job, um, and and here we can see uh, the statistic for from for the data um, we selected, the size the number of objects or instances in the database, when there was the last uh, change in data. Um, we have a top five with, with the most um, populated uh, feature types, uh, a graph, a diagram showing when there is a, a changes is, is, is happen, and then uh, each uh, feature type and, and the, or table has uh, its own statistic. And we can click off one of the feature types and also see the uh, detailed um, uh, changes in that. So it, it, it's a very powerful tool. It's, it's a good insight to 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 have a look into a a, a black box uh, as, as an Oracle database can be. Uh, this is is very powerful communication. Um, I will no, now go back to the page where we saw the metadata and will just highlight four of them. Um, where we have some 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 uh, some some, some detailed uh, Danish uh, metadata elements, we have a link to the legal act where to the data set belong. We have a link to a common public uh, uh, tool where all the Danish public um, processes are being described, uh, and we also have our own um, internal process uh, management system where all uh, my agency's internal processes are documented, uh, written in BPMN. So this are also metadata relevant for, for our users. And we have also managed to, to make the uh, data model uh, a part of the metadata uh, as well as the feature catalog. Again, this, this is also metadata on a very detailed level. So this should be part of uh, of the metadata, and and that's that we have done. The one uh, metadata for for our data set for distribution. Again, I will show the administration module where we configure uh, uh, the, the 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 data product or yeah for distribution. I will highlight that it is here where the data set gets in their special data set identifier um, expressed as an HTTP. P, uh, URI. We, we follow or try to follow the recommended pattern from the ISA Square program. Um, then, secondly, we have to choose uh, into which registrar this data product belongs to. So, we are doing this configuration. And um, then the system also has the function that you, sh you will not, as a metadata responsible, start from scratch. No. You selected, as you saw, the registrar which to the data set belongs. That means that all the metadata from that registrar is inherent into this metadata. So this is a good starting point. And here we have to follow the Inspire metadata regulation. So this is the Inspire metadata plus some more because there's a lot of opportunities in the ISO uh, metadata standard. Um, the system, there is, of course, a functionality, so we can transfer this metadata into the Danish Inspire catalog, where it has to be visible, according to the directive, of course. But we can also export uh, the metadata to an XML file, which is very useful for validating and, yeah, etc. 
And as I said, the, the ISO metadata um, 39 uh, standard allows a lot of metadata. It also allows that you can you can include your uh, your UML and feature catalog, and you can see where into um, the XML that it, that has been done. So the, our feature catalog and our our UML model goes with our metadata, and this and you can access them because they are uploaded to a server. Last but not least, um, as I said, our metadata uh, has to go into several portal. We have uh, the system up here is ours. We use GeoNetworks uh, CSVW transaction uh, service to populate metadata into our national geo portal. Then, you know, it is harvested from the Inspire geo portal. But now our agency for digitization is building a, a, a national data set catalog for, for all uh, data in the public uh, Danish administration, not only geodata. And this is a bit challenging because it's, it's based on CCAN, but, but most importantly, it's it based on uh, DCAT. So we are in, in, in close cooperation with them to, to do this mapping between uh, ISO and, and DCAT. Uh, we are not finished yet, as you can see, but, but we will. Of course, we have also ideas for further developments. Um, only now the system on, only can handle metadata for data sets. Services is also required in, in Inspire, and this, this could be a, a, a further development. As well, uh, an integration uh, to the uh, ETF API, so we can validate our metadata uh, in the workflow. We'll see. Thank you. Are you using any existing master metadata management software, or all that is under your constructions? Do you yeah, everything we have built from scratch. It's our own code, and yeah. <laughs> I think you're right. yeah. Um, for your derived data sets, you have lots of derived data sets, does it help sort of construct the metadata for the derived data sets based on your original source metadata records? So for example, putting in lineage information or any of that kind of thing. So, so you said you have a lot of derived data sets which might be subsets or combinations from yeah. different uh, sources. Yeah. Does this um, system help you populate the metadata for those derived mean, data sets? You know, um, yeah. with you know lineage information and, and, and using the metadata of the original source data sets at all. Yeah, we, for for the metadata describing the ex external data sets, there is a feature in, in the system which allows you to to reuse the metadata from the internal data set. And of course, where there is the one-to-one -one connection, you you get. The, the, the whole metadata. When there are the other connection, for example, two internal data set, you have to choose, okay, which one do you want to start with? They are not merged or something. They, you, you can only choose one. Well, uh, thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, our best practice for publishing metadata from a linked data point of view, as you saw in the presentation of Lars, uh, one of the challenges is to uh, create a, a DCAT uh, profile uh, for uh, open data sets from uh, a geospatial and metadata uh, a set. And that's actually one of the things we are, uh, well, into. Okay, so uh, data sets are hot. Um, we all know the, the Inspire uh, data set portal, which uh, retrieves, harvests the, the data sets from all of, over Europe. But there is actually another one you probably are familiar with, and that's the one for open data. Um, and in the Netherlands, uh, we have also two catalogs, the one for open data, which is harvested for the European one, and the, the national uh, version of uh, our data sets for Inspire and geospatial data sets. Um, unfortunately, as mentioned by uh, the previous uh, uh, speaker, uh, those standards, there are a lot of standards involved. At the geospatial uh, network, there are the, the 
probably very familiar uh, 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 metadata standards, the ISO 1, the INSPIRE technical guideline, the 2.0 zero version, which uh, uh, Paul mentions, and then in the Netherlands we have our own uh, specific Dutch profile based on that one. Well, on the open data side we have a, a, a DECAT, a, a W3C uh, standard, which is implemented in an application profile, and in the Netherlands we have our own profile on the national uh, uh, catalog. And then there's something called GeoDCAT, which is actually uh, um, an approach to get uh, a DGAT profile that can be used for uh, a geospatial data set. Uh, unfortunately, that one is uh, 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 yeah, geared to watch uh, the, the, the 1.3 a technical guideline, not the 2.0. So, well, this is XML and this is linked data. Might be XML, might be JSON, whatever. It's, it's the RDF representation. Um, but it gets worse. Uh, we have a lot of standards. Um, on the right side, you see the, 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 the ISO ones. Uh, we have the ISO uh, 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 150 2003, which is the technical guidelines are based on, but there's actually uh, another one we don't use. Uh, and the GeoDecat uh, profile is based on a TCAT profile, the European one, uh, and is based on the technical guideline version 1.3 and not the 2.0. Um, and actually, the W3C is at, at this moment working on another version, a new version of DCAT 1.1, and we don't know when that is implemented in the application profile. So, a lot of work to be done, a lot of standards, a lot of things going on, and we only want to have data sets from one catalog to the other one. And it's even worse. If you want to uh, combine or you want to see what's the difference between those data sets, you have to go into pages, a lot of pages. And, um, well, it's actually some of them. So it's even more. Okay, so it's a bit hard to get a diff. And then, because you cannot have a diff very easily, it's very hard to have the same data set at, at the same uh, places. It might, it, it might be the case that a data set that is published in the, our uh, uh, geospatial catalog is harvested by our national catalog, a little bit changed because of the different standards, and then harvested by the European data portal, and that same data set is harvested by the other European data portal. And we don't know what it is. And it might even be that, there, that they come up with five data sets because uh, uh, metadata is not really that interoperable and uh, uh, persistent URIs that uniquely identify data set is not available at this moment. So, uh, our ambition uh, to have one unique source for metadata of any particular data set. And that, that unique source can be used for any catalog uh, at least the ones we are talking about here. Um, the, the source might be RDF oriented or XML oriented. Uh, it, it should not matter. It should not matter which you use and you could, it, it should be possible to go from one to the other because it's the same information about the same data set. Um, the meta model specification should be machine readable and human readable. If it's only human readable like the PDF, you, it's very hard to, 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 to see the difference between the, do, the documents and, and have some, some, some interoperability discussion. Uh, it should also be human readable because if we as humans get a, uh, an XML document, well, we probably won't recognize it and we, won't, we cannot un in understand it. Um, and if we have that, we can enable machine translatable metadata between standards and catalogs as large ones. Uh, and we do. Um, okay, what, what was our approach? Uh, our first approach was create a, a machine readable model for all those standards, and we used Shackle. Um, that might not be that familiar for you, for, for you guys, but it's a linked data standard that can be used. I will, I will go into that. Uh, so we create Shackle models for DCAT, for DCAT AP, uh, the application profile, for GeoDCAT, for the Inspire technical guidelines, for the Dutch metadata profile. profile. This seems a lot of work, but it's actually a lot le less work than to combine and investigate those documents. It's more easily to just have the document translated to some formal uh, uh, machine-readable format, 
do that really good, but that's easy work because you just copy and you see if you do it right. And from that moment on, you can have uh, automatic uh, uh, com comparisons. Identify problem areas and propose solutions. So the first one, uh, create a shackle model. So what, sh uh, uh, what is shackle? Shackle is, is the shape constraint language and it is one of the W3 standards used on the internet for linked data to create um, models, data models uh, uh, to, 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 to um, uh, specify constraints, etc. And it might be used to create such pictures. This, this, is, this picture is not made by me or, my, or one of my colleagues. It's generated from the shackle specification. But it can also be used to validate. So if you have uh, a data set, uh, 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 a data set uh, specification, a metadata, uh, you can uh, put it into the shackle playground and it can be validated against the, the format. Um, uh, okay, compare. Uh, this is uh, actually a table from the GeoDecat app uh, document, and it, 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 it states how uh, uh, an element in DCAT can be used to uh, specify an element in the Inspire uh, uh, metadata standard. So this is text. This is one of the, uh, a part of a page of 300 pages we have to look into. And this can be, we can, create that into a formal document, in a shackle document. And, well, we won't go into that, but this is, this is actually a, a linked data format, a turtle it is called, and it's kind of readable. But here you can see that the resource title is over there. And the other parts of the document is also here. In, but there are also a lot of um, tags which are not really into the, the shackle standard, but because it's linked data, we can add, like the, these, They are from the technical document, so we have references from the, the one side to the other side. And then we, we uh, are into identifying problem areas, and the, 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 the most common problem areas are uh, <coughs> URI references versus text. In the, uh, in the, uh, the, the uh, well, of course, in the linked data version, we have a lot of URIs, because that's linked data. Uh, in the in the in the geospatial um, metadata, it it get it is getting better from my point of perspective because we have anchors now. But a lot of uh, code lists, a lot of references to like organizations are just texts, so that's a bit hard. Um, code lists, we have different code lists. Uh, the code lists that are used into the in the ISO standard are not the, are not always the same as in the. Um, the, 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 the DCAT standard, uh, but, but things get better because the European Union is, is really into using the same metadata uh, sets. But we're not there yet. Um, and sometimes we, are, we have different uh, information or complex, more complex structures. So in, in one uh, metadata, they, they use a, a more complex model for modeling organizations versus another a part which, is, which models uh, like licenses more, more difficult. Uh, so, so, and, and it's not always that one of them is, 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 has more information. Sometimes the ISO standard has more information, sometimes the DCAT standard has more information. So, um, uh, to, to wrap up, what was, were the conclusions of this, this project? Um, I think, we should think, we should have one meta model for data sets, applicable for multiple goals, uh, whether it is geospatial, open data sets. It's, it's, really, it's, it's not really understandable why, well, from a historical point of view, it's, it is understandable, but as we are sitting here right now, it's not understanding well we, why, why we maintain that difference. It should, should be possible to have one model for open data, one for geospatial model, or whatever. Um, that metadata specification should have a machine and human readable specification. No more PDFs, uh, except when they are generated. Um, well, from our point of perspective, from the linked data point of perspective, a shackle is a good candidate and can be translated to all the other uh, schema specifications. Uh, but, well, it really isn't that important. It's important that it works. So if we have a UML, uh, uh, a specification that can be translated to a shackle, well, it's okay for us. 
Um, well, getting there is 100% is, is hard but achievable, at least at, at the nation, national level. And, and how we do this is that we have created um, a metadata specification that's actually the combination of the ISO uh, version and the, 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 the open data DECAD version. Uh, so, for example, if you have a, a taxonomy with 10 val uh, values in it that you can use, uh, and um, the, the ISO one has five and um, the, the DCAT version has eight, we create a combined one that has 13. Uh, so we can uh, use them both in our uh, data set, and if we want to uh, publish it to the open data portal, we, you, we use the eight, and if we publish it to the, uh, to the, the ISO version, we use five. So we comply to both standards, but we are possible to have one uh, source of data. This is my uh, my wrap up. Uh, I have a question regarding, like you said, like one specific question for the geodata. So you, I want to know your experience uh, of using GeoDCAT AP. And like you said, like there is a new version of DCAT coming AP, which already includes the special extent and these attributes of the geodata. So if there are two standards available. How is it possible to reach one um, model or use one standard for the metadata, especially for the geospatial part? The, the, the way we you can do it is is if for, uh, is, is like I, I told with the taxonomy that you have uh, in in your in your uh, core model you have both data available. And uh, if you publish it to one or uh, uh, to, the, to the ISO standard, you, you, you leave out the things that are not used there. And if, if you go to the, to the open data, you, you leave out the things that are not used there. Um, uh, that was feasible. Yeah, thank you. I'm Paul Jans from GeoNovum. Uh, you started with uh, explaining that there are several metadata standards, like more 10 or, or a little bit less or a little bit more. Uh, and that, as I understood correctly, you have connected them all. You made ontologies, well, this is not the ontology, but you, that you made an ontology connecting all those. So can we relax now on the harmonization of all of them? Is it connected? Is it linked? Is it, uh, well, does it work? Um, what, what we did actually was uh, uh, combining apples and pears by making them fruit. Uh, as, so, so you, you can now see the difference. And you can see a difference from uh, a, a, a machine-readable version. So you can actually see the work that needs to be done very clearly. So yes, we can relax. We have now a clear vision, so uh, we are uh, uh, aware <laughs> what, what needs to be done. But uh, no, we cannot relax because there's work to be done. Okay, maybe the last uh, question. Um, hello, I'm Geraldine from Flemish government, and uh, we really not agree with this um, proposal in uh, the case that you make another standard then that way. Uh, we did a study as well between GEO and open, general open uh, world, and we posted on W3C and on OGC and Inspire levels the differences between them, and we are bridging the gaps in the basic standards, but creating another standard is not a solution. You have to make the differences in the new versions of each standard lower and lower, uh, but not creating another standard on top of it, that is not really solving the issue. So mapping, making good mappings in the one hand is one thing, and then getting to the sources of the problem is maybe more efficient than creating another standard is our point of view. Well, I totally agree with you. Um, we, 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 uh, if, to make clear, we don't want to create another standard. Um, what we did was uh, to uh, see if it was possible uh, by taking the current situation as a, as, as a given, uh, if it was possible to create one source. Um, and that was only possible by combining. 
Uh, of course, it would be very much better if we have the standards from, from, from top to bottom. And I've spoken to uh, some of your colleague, uh, colleagues, and it was really interesting in what the work you were doing, and, uh, and, I, and I, I'm really looking forward in investigating that uh, a bit more and, and, and support your case to create uh, better levels uh, on the top. Um, uh, doing this made us uh, realize on a, a really uh, factual level what was uh, going on and what needs, things need to be solved. So, uh, yeah. 